you know, on the liver or die, but it had nothing to do with anything I could do. So that you could feel liberated. That's right, yeah. Fatalistic in a good way. Yeah. So um, <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna give it like five because you may have noticed that um, it's uh, there's a light flurry outside that's uh, dusted the ground with a bit of icing sugar. So. Thanks for making it. Yeah, well, I got in the car and closed my eyes and pretended that we weren't fishtailing all over the highway. That was great. Hotel Pennsylvania, four in the morning, go to the six in the morning, go to Newark, fly all day to New Mexico, present four times in a row, get up seven hours later, go to, to KU in uh, Lawrence in, in, in Kansas, do like four presentations. Next morning, I have to be on a flight at 5.30 in the morning to Toronto, which gets up at like 5, and at 7 p.m. I present at the library, and then I'm done with the tour. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's 24 cities in 28 days. I'm third national person. I was. It was a bit interesting. Yeah. It was. Uh, I, they were there. There was a bunch of stuff there that was kind of what I expected, and some stuff that wasn't what I expected. As a Canadian, I'm slightly nervous around people with handguns. So that. that <laughs> yeah. But the uh, the Bitcoin ATM was, was cool. We're just gonna wait like five minutes and see if anybody makes it in a little late from the snow. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Nice monopod, by the way. Thanks. A little bit. Yeah, I think the voice. The, he's 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 older and wiser, certainly. Yeah. No, 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 I went a few times before. And that, now I can keep going because it's tax deductible. I'm writing about burning Oh, Yeah, sure. How do you find, seeing as I was able to use some but I am able to sign the copy. Oh, good. Thanks for the creative promise. How did that work out? Well, it works out pretty well for me. I, you know, it's hard to, to make any kind of empirical statements about the effect on sales. For those of you who don't know, the books are available as free downloads as well as e-books that you can pay for, print books that you can pay for. So the first thing to recognize is that um, all books are available as free downloads. It's just that mine come with permission. Right? And, and so uh, it, it's not about kind of figuring out how to stop people from copying books. It's about how to understand that people will copy your books and, and figure out how to entice them to not treat those books as replacements and instead as, as, enti as enticements. And I think that performing public acts of generosity and trust creates a social contract with at least some of my readers. And that seems to be working. This book's on its second week on the New York Times bestseller list. It hit the New York Times bestseller list the first week it was out and has stayed on it. And we'll know on Wednesday if it stayed on it again. Uh, and so was Little Brother and so was Little Brother in paperback. Uh, and then, you know, leaving aside the commercial considerations, which are what they are, there's also the artistic consideration that, you know, the 21st century copying is not going to get harder, and so any art that is contemporary should be made with the assumption of copying. You know, pe pe things that people love, they'll copy. And you don't have to make contemporary art. You can, you can like, paint in the style of Michelangelo and make your own gesso from scraped rabbit skins. You can be the blacksmith at a Civil War recreation, but like, if you're going to be a science fiction writer, you should at least be contemporary, if not futuristic. So there's this huge artistic dimension. And then, as I'll talk about uh, in the talk today, there's the moral dimension of not having my work form part of the basis for horrific acts of censorship and surveillance in the name of defending copyright. So, well, for, for what it's worth, yeah, I, I realize that I just started. It. You've been the news source for me. We kind of see eye to eye on privacy, copyright, and coffee. Awesome. Uh, so I've been following you for over 10 years. I just started reading you and discovered that it was free. So oh, right. That was amazing. So, well, you know, and that, I think that's an interesting parable about it all, is that um, there's lots of people who you think would... So the, the argument has, when I started, was, oh, you can afford to do this because no one's heard of you. Now the argument is you can afford to do this because you're a bestseller. It's, you know, you sort of can't win. But bestseller is, has got a pretty narrow meaning, right? People who read you for 10 years cannot realize that you publish books, right? And so uh, finding some way to kind of get those people 
involved is, is pretty important. I, I call it sometimes thinking like a dandelion, like, you know, mammals, as I realized when my daughter was born, put a lot of energy into our reproductive strategy and really worry about the outcome of every act of reproduction, whereas dandelions are really interested in not in making sure that every seed germinates, but that every crack has a dandelion growing out of it. And I'm more interested in making sure that everybody who can pay has the chance to read my books than making sure that everybody who reads my books pays. So, uh, well, it's now like six minutes past. Shall we start? Absolutely. All right. Sure. I'm going to briefly introduce okay. you. You're all here because you know who Cory Doctorow is, so I don't really have to introduce Cory Doctorow. I just want to point out that um, uh, Cory is a hero to two communities represented here today, booksellers and librarians. My wife is a librarian. <laughs> So, two for two. Oh, thank you. Uh, Corey's in the forefront of trying to figure out some issues that are, that are, that are both of our industries, industry, well, both of our businesses are confronting the book selling business and the library business. We're all confronting it, and the whole situation is in a terrible state of flux right now, but terrible states of flux offer their own opportunities. So, we're hoping for the best. And as Corey says, with the spirit of generosity, we're going to get to a future that makes sense and that we're all going to enjoy. Um, of course, the author of some um, science fiction books you may be familiar with, some young adult books you may be familiar with, some a lot of books you may be familiar with. They're all on sale today for 25% off because there's a literary retail harmonic convergence today. We're having our sale today, so everything you buy is 25% off, and that's just um, that's just how it worked out. So buy buy early, buy often. I always thought that harmonic convergences were a lost opportunity to sell convergence harmonicas. You know, <laughs> there's the million dollar idea yeah, right, right there. Anyway, I'm going to get off the stage now. Thank and you. Please join me in welcoming Cory Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you all for braving snowpocalypse. And, and thank you very much for having me. I'm also a former bookseller in addition to being someone who used to work in libraries. Uh, I worked in a, a great science fiction store that's still around in Toronto and an academic store that sadly isn't in a really crummy mall store that fa thankfully isn't there anymore. But I love coming into great indie stores. And one of the best things about this tour is, is going to 24 cities and seeing their most awesome independent stores. So it's it's terrific. I can tell right away that this is the kind of place that under normal circumstances you'd have to drag me out of. So it's great. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So rather than read the book to you, which which you can hear me do if you just want to download the podcast of me doing it, and moreover I've edited out all the parts where I habitually make mistakes when I read my work, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about the book. Some of the things that um maybe your uh, English teacher would call the theme of the book. Although, to be frank, I don't know that any book apart from a book about Spider-Man has a theme, because the books about Spider-Man have the Spider-Man theme. The rest of them, as far as I can tell, don't have themes as I think of them. But in any event, there's some stuff in this book that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about that stuff uh, in a structure that is a, a kind of brief recent history lesson. And it starts in February 2010 in an affluent suburb of Philadelphia called Lower Marion, Pennsylvania. And in Lower Marion, it's the kind of place where the school district can afford to give all the students MacBooks. Um, so all the students get MacBooks, and the MacBooks have to come home with them every night to do their homework and back to school every morning. All their assignments are delivered to them over the computer, and all the assignments have to be handed in over the computer. And in February 2010, a high school student filed a lawsuit against the school district. And when you read the complaint, you discover that um, he was called into his principal's office one day. This kid's name was Blake J. Robbins. He was called into his principal's office one day, and the principal said, Blake, you're taking drugs. He and the principal had had some, some run-ins before, and he said, I don't take drugs. And the principal said, oh yeah, can you explain this? And handed him a photo of himself in his bedroom the night before taking a drug. And he said, well, first of all, that's just a Mike and Ice candy. I eat them all the time. And second of all, how did you come to have a photo of me in my bedroom last night? And, um, that's where the lawsuit starts. What we found in the lawsuit is, well, first, that the school correctly assumed that the students would lose or have stolen some of these laptops. So they outfitted it with anti-theft software, and the anti-theft software let them operate the camera on the, on the laptop without uh, turning on the little green light remotely over the internet. And um, second of all, that as Anton Chekhov says, if you put a gun on the mantelpiece in Act 1, it'll go off by Act 3. The corollary of that, or, or corollary in this country, of uh, that is that, um, is that if you give a school disciplinarian the power to spy on her students in September, she'll be spying on them by June. And that's, that's what happened here. Not only had they spied on Blake J. Robbins, they spied on tons of students that they'd had some kind of beef with, and not just a little, a lot. Thousands of photos of these kids 
and obviously sometimes when they were at home and, and often when they were at school, but sometimes when they were undressed and sometimes when they were around uh, people who had nothing to do with the school, parents or friends or older or younger siblings. And after the dust settled on the, on the lawsuit, um, they stopped doing this. They stopped secretly uh, installing software that allowed them to covertly operate the webcam and using that to spy on students. They and other laptop schools like them now tell the students that there is covert laptop surveillance software on their computers that they have to use. And that they should always assume when they're using the laptop that they might be watched. Because if you want to terrorize children into obedience, you don't have to hide the fact that you're spying on them. You know, this is the soul of the idea of the panopticon, this old, this old uh, uh, surveillance idea that surveillance works best when you can't tell whether or not you're being watched. Because then that. you internalize you. the watcher, the policeman moves inside. Speaking of policemen, Ten months later, in November 2010, in Germany, um, we discovered another kind of surveillance. Now, Germany is home to a group of fun-loving, troublemaking, uh, security researcher, freewheeler, hacker types who call themselves the, uh, the Chaos Computer Club. And though they're troublemakers, they get in the right kind of trouble. And in November of 2010, they discovered that um, the uh, the Bavarian government had been secretly infecting the laptops of people that they thought were up to no good with a piece of software that CCC called the Bundestrojaner, the state Trojan, Trojan like a Trojan horse, so that, that gets past your defenses. And that this spyware, because it was 10 months more advanced than the stuff they were using in Lower Marion, Pennsylvania, could also grab your uh, video off your camera, audio, it could grab your keystrokes, it could grab your screen, it could plunder your hard drive. And um, that uh, the CCC, when they looked into this, they realized it had been remarkably badly written, and so anybody could, could insert themselves into it. You could go to a Starbucks, scan the network for people who had been infected, you know, get your laptop on the network and scan for people who were infected, and then you could hijack their computers, right? You could ride along, ride piggyback on the police and the government who were spying on them, because when you take away a computer's immune system, opportunistic infection sets in, right? So now we'll go to last September, September 2012. In September 2012, eight companies entered into a settlement with the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. That's the government agency whose job it is to make sure companies aren't abusing the public trust and public interest. And, and um, these, seven of these eight companies, they were in the rent-to-own business. They would rent you a laptop month on month on month, and after many months, many years, you'd own the laptop. It would cost you much more than it would to buy the laptop outright. But if you can't afford to own a laptop and you want to participate fully in the 21st century, it might be your only option. Now, the eighth company, they made laptop security software for tracking down people who stopped making payments or tracking down stolen laptops. And you might be able to see where this is going. So this company was called Designerware. They were based in Northeast. Ten cents a page. The price has gone up to know the law. There's a funny thing about the law. The law belongs to no one. It's not really public property, it's no one's property. Because it's the law. You're allowed to do anything you want with the law when you have it. You can sell it, you can give it away, you can copy it as much as you'd like. So some activists and some people at, at Princeton, they put together a service called Recap, which is Pacer Backwards. And the way Recap works, there's a little browser plugin, and every time you went to pay for a page of law, a page of law, it would, it would check to see whether that page of law had already been paid for by someone using Recap. And if they had, it gave you that copy. You didn't have to pay for it again. And if they hadn't, you paid your dime, and nobody paid for it again. It went into Recap. So Aaron took $1.5 million worth of law and put it into Recap, right? the 20% of law most widely cited in American jurisprudence, which we all thought was completely awesome and cool. Everybody that is except for the FBI. <laughs> who began to surveil him, staked him out, opened a file on him, and brought him in for questioning, tried to get him to talk to them without his lawyer present. Uh, now, this is a public service announcement. If the police or any branch of law enforcement wants to question you, you should ask to have a lawyer present. Uh, I mentioned that the other night when I was giving this talk in San Francisco. Uh, as those of you who were here at the start know that this is a 24-city tour. So uh, I, I've been to lots of places and, and talked about this stuff. But after the San Francisco talk, a woman came up and said, uh, I work for the FBI. I said, oh, that's great. What did you think of my advice that you should only talk to the FBI with a lawyer present? She said, that's excellent advice. So from the horse's mouth, you have it. <laughs> Don't talk to, to law enforcement without a lawyer. Aaron didn't talk to law enforcement without a lawyer. Nothing bad happened to him. He got off scot-free. But it, he wasn't so lucky the next time. In 2010, he went after a bigger database called JSTOR. 
that holds all the scientific and technical journal articles published. And, and um, that science, that's, that's mostly publicly funded science. It's stuff that either government agencies have done or government research institutions or government funded public universities or private universities with public funding, private research institutions with public funding. It's our science. We paid for it. But it's not free to get it from PACER. You have to pay for it again. Either you go to a big, rich institution, a fancy university, a public school that's exceptionally well funded, some of the better private schools, and you get access to it because they pay a titanic sum for a subscription, or you pay by the article. And it can be 50 bucks an article. Journal publishers get to set their own prices. And it's very expensive, which, which is bad. It's bad because science is the truth of the world, right? It is the, it is the tiny grains of truth that scientists have um, uh, dutifully and diligently extracted from the universe, wrestled out of the universe, and put together in a way that becomes a, makes a coherent picture of how the world works. And every couple of years, someone's going to ask you to vote for them based on their theory of what the truth of the world is. And it'd be very nice to know whether or not their theory conforms to our best evidence. But it's also important because we never know where this stuff is going to lead, where access to knowledge gets you. So. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a kid on the radio on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation from Baltimore. Uh, he was another one of these prodigy kids. When he was 14, he was going to a, a well-funded school with access to JSTOR. He was reading an article, and he realized that he had an idea for detecting pancreatic cancer early. You may know that pancreatic cancer kills lots of people because we detect it's too late to do anything about it. So. Um, this kid, he, he spammed the entire cancer research department at Johns Hopkins, a thousand researchers, right? 999 of them ignored him, and one of them emailed him back and said, that's not a totally stupid idea. Why don't you come in and talk about it? The reason this kid was on the radio last week is that he and this researcher are now ready to ship a working pancreatic cancer test that works much more early than, than the ones that we have today. And on the radio, he said, uh, you know, I'm just a kid, but I had this idea because I, I had access to the science. I think everyone should, and that's why I think what Aaron did was so important. So what did Aaron do? Aaron was, by 2010, a fellow at Harvard University, and down the street is MIT, a nice, fancy, private university with some very good policies. They let the public come and use their campus. If you're ever in Cambridge, Mass., you can just go hang out at MIT. And moreover, they let you use their Wi-Fi. It's free for anyone to use. And what's even better, it's hooked up to JSTOR. So Aaron started walking down Massachusetts Avenue to MIT and downloading thousands of JSTOR articles, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. We don't know what he was going to do with them. Chances are, I guess, that he was going to make them public, but we don't know. But the network administrators could see that someone was downloading a heck of a lot of JSTOR, and they tried to shut him down. They did lots of different things to try to shut it down. They didn't know who it was. And after some cat and mouse, I guess he figured, enough is enough. So he broke into a wiring closet on campus. Now, when I say broke into a wiring closet at MIT, you probably think, that he defeated the biometric locks on a level three biohazard <laughs> containment facility, right? Now, the, his, his break-in methodology was that he fiendishly turned the doorknob in a closet the public went in and out of all the time. Uh, a homeless guy kept his clothes there. So Aaron went into this closet and connected a laptop to the network and started to download articles by the millions with the script he'd written. And that's when they caught him. And that's when they charged him with computer fraud and abuse crimes and told him that they could put him in jail for 50 years. He hadn't distributed the articles. He was entitled to the articles. All he was guilty of at this point was taking too many books out of the library because he was entitled to download those articles, but he was not entitled to do so automatically according to the terms, of terms and conditions, and that's where they got him. So 97% uh, of the people who were federally indicted settle. Aaron didn't settle. He figured he was in the right. He had some money. He knew some great lawyers. He was going to fight it. Uh, so they play dirty. They uh, issued a press release saying that they were going to put him in jail for 35 years because, quote, stealing is stealing whether you do it with a laptop or a crowbar, which suggests that federal prosecutors not only don't understand laptops, they also don't understand crowbars. Um, and uh, they um, set out to essentially uh, use up all his money before he got to court. They, they wouldn't give him the documents he was entitled to uh, in order to prepare his defense his lawyers were entitled to. So he had to keep paying to send his lawyers back to court over and over again to get court orders that the prosecutors would ignore, and they do it again. It was a kind of calculated lawlessness that, that even to this day, they still, two years and more after he was indicted, they still don't have some of these documents, but it was bleeding him out. He was, he was running out of money. But he kept fighting, and he kept fighting not just this, but other stuff. He fought SOPA. You'll remember SOPA as the bad internet proposal, internet law proposal that resulted in kids across America not being able to do their homework for a day because Wikipedia shut itself down in protest. Um, 
So uh, SOPA was a parade of horrors that I could talk about all day long, but let me just say that it would, it would have made it impossible to run a website where you had any place where people could talk to each other, where they could post messages or upload their own material, because it made you responsible for making sure they didn't infringe copyright, which is hard, because sometimes it's hard to tell whether, whether something infringes copyright or not, unless you're a lawyer. But also to make sure that nobody linked to a place where they infringe copyright. So if you had a little message board for your Little League team where you planned out the carpools, if someone linked to Tumblr, you'd have to make sure nobody on Tumblr was infringing copyright, somehow knowing all the things that were on Tumblr. If you look at everything on Tumblr, there will be some things that you will never unsee, no matter or how hard it is, <laughs> right? Um, and then there was even a version of this that said you were also responsible for making sure nobody linked to a place where they were linking to places where copyright was infringed. And that was like bananas because as soon as someone linked from Facebook to the to the Little League message board, you now had to police Facebook and make sure that nobody linked to the Pirate Bay somehow. End of the internet as we know it. It's the return of cable TV. Media companies get to talk to us. We don't get to talk to each other. We never get to talk back to them. And everybody in D.C. said that it was a done deal that the votes had been counted, that the congressmen and senators who had taken money for years and years from the entertainment industry to help them get elected had been given their marching orders and been told that there would be no more money for the next election campaign if they didn't vote this way. And everybody said, get used to it. Figure out what to do about a world where SOPA is law. Don't fight SOPA. You're wasting your time. It was terrible advice because, as we showed, we could beat SOPA by all of us doing it together, an activist coalition across the country coming up with brand new tactics never before seen, including a little widget you could stick on your website. And when people came to visit your website, it would say, hey there, uh, I see you like my website. I'm going to have to shut it down if this dumb law passes. Uh, if you don't think that's a good idea, tell me your zip code. Oh, okay, well, here's your senator, here's your congressman, and um, here's where they stand on this, and here's a button you can click to call them right now and talk to their staffers and give them a piece of your mind. We put 8 million phone calls through to Congress that way. And Congress, before, had thought, you know, we can't get reelected without campaign funding. What they realized afterwards is that as hard as it is to get reelected without major donors, it's much harder to get reelected without votes. <laughs> and that was the end of SOPA. We were all very happy and proud of ourselves. Aaron was happy and proud of himself, I think. But it all weighed on him. He would meet with the prosecutors, and they would say things like, there's no deal that doesn't involve a felony conviction, which means you can't vote, you can't run for office, you can't be a doctor, or a teacher, or a lawyer. You have to pay a million dollar fine, and uh, you're going to go to jail no matter what. There's no deal that didn't, doesn't involve prison sentences. And I guess, I guess it got at him. Six weeks ago, on January the 11th, on the uh, second anniversary of his arrest, Aaron killed himself uh, in his apartment in Brooklyn. So I'm on tour with this book you helped me write, and I'm trying to figure out how to talk about this stuff to folks like you. And uh, there's one thing I know, which is that Aaron didn't do any of this stuff because information wants to be free. I had a, a long, soulful heart-to-heart -heart with information, and it confided in me that the only thing it wants is for us to stop anthropomorphizing it. <laughs> <laughs> information doesn't want anything. It's just an abstraction. But people want to be free. And you make people free with good information. If you know what the law says, you're more free than someone who doesn't. If you know the truth of the world, the, the science that we've already paid for, you're more free than someone who doesn't know the truth. And if you know what your devices are doing, then you're more free than someone who doesn't. You, you can be sure that there isn't an eye staring back out, out at you from that little lens on your phone or your laptop or your uh, Xbox 360. But we get it wrong in this country. We get it wrong over and over again. In 1998, Congress passed the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. It's another parade of horrors, but I won't tell you all about it. I'll just say that it has a thing in it called anti-circumvention that makes it against the law to remove the locks from the devices you own. So if a device is locked up in some way that stops you doing something the manufacturer doesn't want you to do, like your DVD player that only plays DVDs that were bought in North America, or your Xbox that only plays games that are blessed by Microsoft and not games that your friends wrote, or your uh, computer that only plays DVDs and won't let you save them to the hard drive, or your phone which only uses one network and not another. The only reason it does that is there's a line of code or two in there that stops you from doing it, a software lock. And if you remove that lock, you break the law under the DMCA. Even though the lock belongs to you, even though the computer belongs to you, even though you commit no other crime, removing locks is a lot illegal. Not a little illegal, a lot illegal. Maximum sentence for the first offense, five years in jail and a $500,000 fine. Uh, maximum uh, uh, sentence for repeat offenders is 10 years in jail and a $1 million fine. So your, your uh, Nintendo 3DS, 
you have a Nintendo 3DS, a little pocket computer, every time you turn it on, it phones home. It connects to the internet and, and connects to Nintendo servers, even if you don't want it to. And then it checks to see whether there's an update for itself, even if you, you really don't want that to happen. And it downloads it and installs it, even if you object. And after it installs it, it reboots itself and checks to see whether you've tampered with the locks in any way. And if you have, it switches itself off and will never switch on again. Right? And it's against the law to remove that lock or explore that lock or tell people information that they can use to remove the lock. And this stuff matters because no one of us can find out what our devices are doing all on our own. I gave this talk in Seattle at the start of the tour and a woman put her hand up and said, you're scaring the pants off of me. What are am I going to do to make all my devices safe? And I said, you won't and I won't make all of our devices safe. If I just finished talking to you about waterborne parasites, you wouldn't be saying, what do I do to run my own water filtration facility? What do I do to make sure the sewers are adequately maintained? The way that you have sewers and water that are adequately maintained and safe for human consumption is by having a society that recognizes that water is life and death and that the uh, regulation of water and the treatment of water should not be a political football, should not be something that is put aside for someone's profit maximization strategy. And that's what we need for networks and for the devices that we connect to them. But that's not what we have. We regulate the internet like it was something like a fax machine attached to a waffle iron. We regulate it like it was telephone 2.0, the second coming of cable TV, or God help us all, the world's greatest pornography distribution system. And not with the gravitas that it deserves, not with the life or death, heart-stopping seriousness that it deserves. Now, why do we get it so wrong? Money, right? I mean, we all know this. We know that this is why lots of regulation goes off the rails. Because if you want to get elected, you need a lot of money. And if you want a lot of money, the easiest way to get it is to ask people who have a lot of money for it. And to get money for your next campaign, you have to keep them happy while you're in office. How do you keep people who have a lot of money happy when you're in office? You pass laws that help them make more money. They use the money that they've made based on the laws that you passed on their behalf to pay to get you elected the next time around. And over and over and over again, lather, rinse, repeat, and what you've got is a system where it's a felony to find out what your phone is doing. Whether it's spying on you, whether it's telling other people what you're doing, whether it's exposing your most intimate secrets. So when I worked on this book, I knew that I wanted there to be a kind of next generation election campaign, one that wasn't about money, one where an independent candidate could get elected without a party machine, without major donors. And I wrote to all these campaign strategists I knew who were really good at their job, people who'd worked on campaigns for Obama, for Dean, various Republican strategists, and I asked them for their best guess. And what they sent me back was stuff that was way too much inside the beltway and inside coloring inside the lines. And then I asked Aaron, and I thought maybe in a day or two he'll send me back some bullet points. He sent me back an hour later a, a, a complete design document for what he called a machine for getting votes. Right? A way to organize uh, uh, social media and voters of good conscience on social media to get people elected without major donors, without party affiliation, so that the only people they answered to if they took office was the people who put them into office. And it was so good, it was shovel ready. I pasted it straight into the book, all except the last two sentences, which were, gotta go, I'm gonna go build this now. <laughs> so the world we live in is made of computers and it's made of networks. If you remove the computers from most of the buildings, they cease to be inhabitable in pretty short order. Which means that our buildings these days are just fancy cases for computers that we happen to walk around inside of. Your car is certainly a computer that hurdles you down the road at 50, 60 miles an hour with you trapped inside, surrounded by other hurtling computers with other humans trapped inside them. The 747 I flew from London to Seattle with at the start of this tour is a flying Solaris workstation in a very fancy custom aluminum case connected to some very badly secured SCADA controllers. <laughs> so we're already putting our bodies inside of computers. But not only that, we're starting to put computers inside of our bodies. Um, those of you who are members of the iPod generation, those of us who are members of the Walkman generation, we are collectively logging so many earbud hours that when the day comes and we reach a certain age, we will have hearing aids. And possibly there'll be hipster, retro, plastic, beige, transistor-driven analog hearing aids, but it's far more likely that they will be computers. And those computers will be computers we put in our body, and those computers will know what we're hearing, and they'll be able to stop us from hearing things, and they'll be able to make us hear things that aren't there, and they'll be able to tell other people what we've heard. So we have to get this right. And that may sound far-fetched and science fictional to you, but it's actually a toned-down version of the world we already live in. Because last November, 
a researcher named Barnaby Jack gave a presentation at a security conference in Australia on his work on implanted defibrillators, which are great technology. If you have a bad heart, if your heart loses the rhythm, if it's been damaged by a heart, a heart attack, um, uh, your doctor, she can anesthetize you, cut you open, spread your ribs, reach into your chest cavity and affix a, a computer with a battery directly to your heart. And it listens to your heart beat, and if your heart loses the beat, it can give you a tiny jolt of electricity and get your heart beating again. It's like a miniature version of what happens when the EMTs come and put the paddles on you. And doctors, well, they want to know what these things are doing, right? Once they, once they put them in your chest, they want to they get telemetry off of them, data off of them. And that's messy, because it's inside your chest cavity. You don't want to attach a cable to it. So um, it's got a wireless interface, which is where Barnaby Jack kind of came in. Because from 30 feet away, using the wireless interface, he could detect your defibrillator and reprogram it and cause it to infect other defibrillators nearby by probing wireless for them. And then he could cause them to infect other ones and at a set interval or at some time in the future, or at random times, he could cause them to deliver lethal shocks to the people whose bodies they were. So this is not going to be a matter of life and death in the distant future. This is a matter of life and death now, and we have to get it right. Um, I also asked Aaron to contribute an, an afterword to this book. Uh, this book and the one that came before it in the duology, it's not really a series, uh, they both have afterwards by people who have some ideas about what you can do now that you've read them. To, to carry on. So the first one, Little Brother, it had, it had an afterword by the security researcher uh, Bruce Schneier who explained how when we get security and risk wrong, we take away freedom and make ourselves less safe. And also an afterword from uh, Bunny Huang, the uh, MIT uh, engineering student, the PhD candidate in engineering, who broke the security on the Xbox so that he could install Linux on it and run his own programs on it. And he explains how to do reverse engineering. He wrote a great book about this, by the way, called uh, Hacking the Xbox, which you can either buy in stores or get as a free, downloadable, Creative Commons license book. Terrific book. For this one, I got Jacob Applebaum to write me afterward. Jacob's uh, a volunteer with the WikiLeaks project. He's, he's never leaked anything, but he's a spokesman sometimes. And whenever he crosses the border, he's uh, detained for hours by the Customs and Border Patrol and questioned without a lawyer. They say that you don't have any civil rights at the border. And all of his uh, computers and hard drives and phones and devices are copied off by the feds. So he, he travels with blank ones. Or he sometimes, he says, loads up his telephone address book with the addresses of people he doesn't like. Uh, <laughs> and and he, he keeps copies of the Bill of Rights on his thumb drives. Um, <laughs> But then I asked Aaron for an afterword, and Aaron wrote me a, a great afterword, a letter to people who care about this stuff and want to know what they can do. And he explains how the SOPA fight unrolled for him, and at the end he says, it's not supposed to happen this way. A, a group of ragtag kids does not stop one of the most powerful forces in DC just by typing on their laptops, but we did it, and we can do it again, and it only works if you take part. Which is really the message of the talk, it only works if you take part. There are lots of things that you can do to take part. You can get formally involved with one of the many, many, many organizations that care about this stuff. Thankfully, although a few years ago, there were only a couple of organizations who cared about this, Electronic Frontier Foundation, whom I used to work for being one of them. Uh, but now, there's so many, I couldn't even name them all if I stood here all day. In addition to EFF, there's Demand Progress, the one that Aaron helped found, and the ACLU, and Public Knowledge, and Fight for the Future, and so many more, and I list a ton of them in the back of the book, so you, there's a, a reference there if you want to see it. But you can also get involved by making better choices about technology, because we get to choose. This is the beginning of the future, right? And we are deciding what the future will be. We are deciding whether we're going to have a future where the computers listen to us, where the default posture of a device you use is yes, master, or whether computers boss us around, where their default posture is, I'm sorry, I can't let you do that, Dave. We get to choose. We get to buy devices or use devices or demand devices that are open enough that we or someone we trust is allowed to take them apart and see how they work and make sure they're not doing anything untoward. So we can buy machines that run Linux instead of machines that run Mac OS or machines that run Windows. I've been using GNU Linux now for years and years. It took a week for me to get used to it, just like it took me a week for, for me to figure out where we were keeping the cutlery after we, we remodeled the kitchen. And then the operating system just disappeared, because operating systems do disappear. If you're noting, noticing your operating system, there's something wrong. You don't use your computer for its operating system. It's like having to notice your doorknobs. If you're noticing your doorknobs, something is broken. It's, uh, it's plumbing. It's utility stuff. So you can choose free and open systems. 
You can choose free and open mobile systems. You can use Android-based devices, which although they are more restricted than I'd like, at least are not illegal to take apart and see how they're working, which is why a researcher named Trevor Eckhart was able to take one apart, decompile the software, and figure out that the phone companies had secretly installed spyware on 141 million phones in this country, a piece of software called um, uh, Carrier IQ that could capture all of your passwords and all of your text messages and uh, plunder your, your uh, files, including your pictures, and track your location. And he was able to find that out by looking at Android devices, and then he went and looked at, at Mac devices or, or Apple devices using what he knew. But he was worried that if he started with the Mac that he might get in trouble. He almost did get in trouble anyways. The, uh, as soon as he started issuing statements about this, the phone company started threatening with lawsuits and calling out federal prosecutors. And that's the problem, right? When you stack the deck so that people who tell the truth about the ways that our devices are putting us at risk are liable to prosecution, are liable to lawsuits, then those people don't tell us about the bad stuff that's going on. So we get to choose. There's one more thing I'm going to say, and then I'll take your questions. And it's brief, because it's not something I'm any kind of expert at. Uh, and it's something I told Aaron's parents I would talk about when I was going out on tour with this book. Uh, and it's suicide and depression. So people get depressed. Uh, getting depressed is normal and a normal response to bad stuff. And maybe you're under a federal indictment and facing 35 years in jail, or maybe you've got problems at home, romantic problems, marriage problems, money problems, job problems. Maybe you've got addiction problems or abuse problems. Maybe the problem is something in your past you can't remember. Maybe it's something you can't even put your finger on. Maybe it's just bad chemicals. But whatever your problem is, it's easy to get really down, really, really down, so low that you think you'll never get up again, so dark you think you'll never see the light again. And when you feel like that, you can feel like the world would be a better place if you weren't in it. And people feel like that more than we talk about. I have felt that way. But the one thing you can be sure of is that whatever your problems are, being dead won't solve them. Dead people don't solve problems. Dead people do nothing. That's what it means to be dead. You're out of the game. You don't get to iterate from dead. You don't get to try anything else if that one didn't work. We know so much about each other right now. If I watch your uh, Foursquare, I can see where you are. If I watch your Facebook, I can see what you're saying. If I watch your Instagram, I can see what you're eating. <laughs> but unless I ask you, and unless I listen very, very, very carefully, I might never know what you're feeling. It's easy to feel like you know that people are OK when you see all of this traffic streaming off of the services they use. But we have to take explicit action to take care of one another if we're going to do that. It's not enough to assume. There's a thing I would have said to Aaron uh, if I'd thought to, if he'd called me, if I'd realized. Uh, and I'm going to say it to you because I never got a chance to say it to him. You might get a chance to say it to someone else, or you might need to hear it sometime, and it's this. Whatever problems Aaron was facing, killing himself didn't solve them. Whatever problems Aaron was facing, his problems are now unsolved forever. If he was lonely, he will never again be embraced by his friends. If he was despairing of the fight, he will never again rally his comrades with his strategy and leadership. If he was sorrowing, he will never again be lifted up into joy. So it's kind of a down note to end this on. But the up note is, the, nice, the, the good part is that, as Aaron said, we get to choose, and it only works if we take part. We get to choose technology that makes us more free instead of technology that takes our freedom away. We get to choose to use our networks to take care of each other instead of atomizing ourselves from one another, alienating ourselves from one another. We get to choose. And it only works if you take part. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> then, um, then I'm going to go to DC. You guys have any questions? That kid is such a powerful, unlicensed Qton emitter. <laughs> Don't tell the Federal Cuteness Commission about it. <laughs> yeah? What does it feel like to go around and see people like holding your work in their hands? It's pretty awesome, I have to say. Uh, it's, it's, as, a, as a Canadian who's become also gotten a British passport, I'm supposed to be very self-effacing. And so I never know what to do. I just want to go... But, um, but I'm kind of inside, I'm doing the touchdown dance. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Where do people learn? Because you talk about knowledge being power. And uh -huh. a bunch of us gray hair, like, love, and we're connected to the knowledge that you're talking about.
Uh -huh. And we want to be empowered with the information. And yet I'm so afraid because as the next generation comes up, where are they getting the guidance? Where are the role models and the teachers? I agree. I mean, so the question is, where do, where do young people learn to use technology? I mean, in, in one specific thing is that the books both have bibliographies, kind of giving you suggestions about where to pick up your reading if you want to learn more about the stuff. Because the technology in the book is meant to be at least plausible, if not real, stuff that could be made even if it's not made. Um, but uh, in terms of the, the learning stuff, I think we're, we're, we're actually in a crisis. Not least because schools and libraries that receive federal funding are required to implement censorship software on the networks. Um, so normally to stop kids from looking at naughty pictures, right? Um, but it doesn't work very well. There, there aren't enough proofs in all the world to identify all the bad websites, right? Uh, and so, you know, you run at a crude hours before the heat death of the universe. So uh, the, um, as a result, kids end up seeing things that they probably shouldn't see. And then they also overblock because you can't possibly correctly characterize this stuff. And they especially overblock in areas that you really wish they wouldn't, like reproductive health and LGBT issues and so on, where you, you particularly want kids to be able to get their information. But the piece of this that's not widely appreciated or understood is that in order to stop people from looking at bad web pages, you have to spy on all the web pages they look at, right? You have to, 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 to stop them from making bad clicks, you have to know all their clicks. And schools and libraries, they don't write their own censorware. They buy it off the shelf from companies whose major customers are, you know, uh, crappy uh, dictatorships in the Middle East and who use these as, as part of their national firewalls and then repurpose it for Fortune 100 corporations and American schools and libraries. And we send them the click streams of our kids. And because um, any affirmative measure that you take to stop your click stream from being sent around, uh, is punishable at school, we have kids who instead of learning to stop themselves from being surveilled and to be private on the internet, are actively punished when they take countermeasures to stop themselves from being surveilled and to protect themselves on the internet. And who only learn to use, uh, and whose experience of the, the, the bad parts of the internet, the scary parts of the internet, is totally unsupervised. And so that, you know, I, uh, I live in, in London and there's lots of things that my daughter could get into trouble with there. She's only five. And we walk around town and sometimes we see things that in an ideal world we wouldn't have and she wouldn't see, like homeless people or people who have substance problems who are passed out on the street. But she sees them for the first time with adult supervision, right? And, and her experience of these things is, is in the company of someone who can explain and contextualize it for her. And um, the equivalent on the internet there's no supervision for it. You discover it when you do something like use a random proxy on the internet that may or may not also be spying on you to get around your school network so that you can see YouTube or access one of the estimated 25% of relevant curricular documents that are blocked by most schoolware. Um, so it, we have kids growing up without the kind of networked instruction that we would hope that they would get. Uh, and it's hard to know what to do about that because it, it, it's, it, it's very hard to imagine a lawmaker saying, uh, we should take the porn filters out of schools, right? You can just imagine what the what the opponent of that lawmaker would do in the next in the next campaign. But you could also imagine, for example, students rather than risking expulsion for uh, uh, circumventing these systems, instead um, trying to build the evidence for getting rid of them altogether, like compiling reports from their fellow students about inappropriate blocking and easy circumvention. So you can see that you're spending money for stuff that doesn't work and is easy to defeat in any event. Talk to teachers about, about interference with their lesson plans. You hear from teachers all the time, oh, I found a YouTube video in the morning that I wanted to teach in my afternoon class and it got blocked over the lunch break and now I'm handing out worksheets because, they're, because my lesson plan is shot. Right? So talk to teachers, do Freedom of Information Act requests, learn how to do them. What, what better piece of civic literacy than learning how to do Freedom of Information Act requests and find out which companies and how much money uh, the, the school district is using to, to uh, do this ineffective and, and harmful censorship and surveillance. And, and then research the companies and present it. Present it to your school for extra credit. Present it to your principal. Present it to the PTA. Present it to the school board. Call the local press. Send it to me. I'll put it on Boing Boing. We'll find other schools that do the same thing. And we will build a nationwide evidentiary case, and not just nationwide, because this is a global problem, a global evidentiary case for not letting war criminals see everything that our children do and punish them for doing anything that protects their privacy.
Yeah, well, there's another talk I do that's about that. <laughs> I'm going to be talking at ALA this year to librarians about it. I've got a question that kind of dovetails in with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm one half of the development team for this unlicensed Python emitter. Yes. And um, <laughs> I, so I've always kind of been interested in sort of cyberpunk and sort of you know knowing, being aware of where your data is going. Mm -hmm. But it's really become more urgent to me recently. And I, so I'm trying to figure out what my you know what our approach is towards uh, how we want to work because we don't want to we don't want to censor him. We don't want to um, you know give him horror stories of the internet. We do want him to sort of look think for himself and be responsible on it. Yeah, yeah. And so, so far, we call it definitely we want to model the appropriate behavior. Yeah. But um, I just want to hear any thoughts on that that you could contribute. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with the same thing because I've got a five-year-old, right? We're winging it. No one's ever done this before. No one's ever raised a five-year-old in 2012 before, 2013 before, right? It's, it's, we're doing it new. I'll, I'll call you in just a sec. So uh, it, it's, it's, you know, we model the behavior we want to see. We uh, we sit with her when she uses network devices uh, now, and we, we don't let her use them when she's out of our earshot and out of our eyesight. Um, we uh, uh, help steer her towards the stuff she wants, to, that, that we want her to see. And it's funny because um, the only thing where that's ever come up to be a fight is uh, once she was tapping related videos on YouTube on a tablet, and she came across like a Barbie commercial that no advertising standards board would have ever allowed on the air. And um, I, I could hear it, right? I could hear it, because normally her pattern is like, Daddy, get me a Dora the Explorer video, and then so I get, or now she can use voice search. And so she'll find one, and then she'll just, because she's preliterate, she'll just tap on one of the videos on the side and not be able to see it. It's Dora, la exploradora, en español. So she'll hear one in Spanish, but she's cool with that. She likes it. And then in French, and then in Russian, and then in Portuguese. And then usually it'll be like one where like someone has dubbed in, you know, screaming and swearing, right? And I can tell, and she never cares about that stuff. She just says, Daddy, get it back, right? And so I'll help her get it back, and we'll start over again. Um, so the one time where I actually had to go over and yank the tablet out of her hands was this Barbie ad. And the, the Barbie ad, like she talked about it for weeks. Daddy, do you remember when I saw that video on the tablet with the, with the toys? What were those toys about? Can I get those toys? <laughs> and um, there's no parental filter in the world that would block that stuff, right? right? Uh, so I think that like, you know, even if even if I wanted to use a parental filter, I don't know how I would because the stuff that, that she could end up seeing, even when you leave out all the stuff that people consider inappropriate for children, is, is, is much worse. So I don't know exactly how we're going to solve this, but we're going to do it one little bit at a time. You, you sounded like you had something trenchant to add. Uh, listen to your kids. Listen to your kids. Good advice. Yeah, starting, starting now, starting now. We do have a couple of rules. One is, uh, anytime she says, I'm bored, we turn off the device. <laughs> Which is good. It's, sorry, you can just leave that there. We were, we, you know, it took us a while to figure out that I'm bored means uh, not find me a different video. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, now the rule is anytime she says, I'm bored, the device gets switched off. My friend Ben Rosenbaum, uh, who I've written with before, I wrote a story called True Names with him that was up on the Hugo Ballad a couple of years ago. He is, his wife is a behavioral psychologist. She's a cognitive behavioral therapist. And uh, they have some kind of elaborate system of red cards, yellow cards, and green cards in their house where anyone can red card someone else uh, for bad behavior. But the total number of red cards, it's kind of a leaky bucket. So every time someone red cards someone, the points, point score for the house goes up. And then every week, a certain number of points are deducted. And when, if, the red, if the number of points reaches a certain threshold, they go into like uh, red alert. And in red alert, nobody's allowed to use any devices in the house. So the parents have to stop using their laptops and so on. They have a whole bunch of rules about what they do. And they, certain toys get locked away and certain parental activities are curtailed. No, e no work evenings out and so on until they fall back to green. And that sounds great if, if also a bit mad, uh, but it sounds great. They also have a system where they score uh, points for doing chores. He and his wife, not he and the kids, where every time they do a chore, they, they award themselves points, and they have a running tally of how many points each of them has scored. That's like now into its 15th year. Uh, and so there's never any arguments about who's doing more chores. Uh, and, if, and if there's a chore that doesn't get done, they raise the point score on it. Uh, they are, they are uh, essentially like living the cognitive behavioral dream. <laughs> That's right, yeah, there's a hamster wheel. And, uh, <laughs> they work in the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah? 
do you find yourself deliberately targeting young adult fiction when you're writing, or did that just kind of come naturally and kind of get placed on your So page? why am I writing young adult fiction for this book as opposed to other books? Um, I, I mean, in part, I think um, when you write books with young adult protagonists, they usually end up being young adult books. And writing books with young adult protagonists is really exciting because to be a young adult is to do a series of very brave and dramatic things that are only brave and dramatic because you're doing them for the first time, right? The first time you tell a lie of substance, the first time you do something noble for a friend and sacrifice something, you are changing yourself in a way that you cannot predict, right? You'll be a different person when you're done, and you have no basis to judge what person you're going to be going in. Uh, and so it's remarkably dramatic in a way that it isn't the hundredth time you do it. And so it makes the lives of young people dramatic in ways that is really exciting to write about. And I think, you know, when we criticize young people for, for being, you know, for being dramatic, we miss the fact that it is incredibly dramatic to do things for the first time. Uh, someone back there, yeah. Yeah. Is there any retribution against these people? Is there any way that we can find a way yeah. to, to bring these prosecutors under the spotlight and allow them to possibly be prosecuted? What, yeah. So what can we do about the prosecutors who went after Aaron? I mean, so on the one hand, I agree. I, we, there were there are petitions to censure both Steve Heyman and his uh, his uh, assistant Carmen Ortiz, who were the, the prosecutors who went after Aaron. Uh, but um, you know, this isn't two rogue prosecutors. If it was two rogue prosecutors, we wouldn't have a 97 percent plea bargain rate in this country. This is a system of prosecutorial overreach that is nationwide. And so what we need is substantive reform to sentencing guidelines so that we don't have people under threat of decades in prison being coerced into taking deals even when they believe that they're innocent. Um, and so there are campaigns around that. ACLU is one, Innocence Project. There's a whole ton of organizations that work on this kind of thing. Um, certainly there's been efforts to reform the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Zoe Lofgren, a congressman from California, introduced something called Aaron's Law, which is a preamble to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that says, you know, the, the, uh, just, you know uh, uh, for avoidance of doubt, federal prosecutors, Congress did not mean this to criminalize violating terms of service, uh, which would be a nice little step, but it's, it's you know, uh, it's, not just, it's not just people who do security work who get threatened with prison and go to jail because they, they were coerced into it because if once a prosecutor sets their sights on you, you go to jail. I mean, it's, it's, you're far more likely to end up in jail even if you're innocent or if your crimes are minor if, if it's a drug-related crime. And there are tons and tons of drug-related uh, uh, crime reform organizations that are looking for humane ways to end the war on drugs. Uh, and, you know, the, it, it, while um, the CFAA is used disproportionately to attack um, uh, people who are historically pretty privileged, which is why it's pretty shocking when we hear about it. Drug laws are used disproportionately against people who lack privilege, people uh, who are brown mostly, and people who are poor. And so, uh, you know, if, if we want to set our sights somewhere, let's not look at just these prosecutors. Let's look at the, the, the gross injustices that put tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people behind bars in this country that has led to the privatization of the prison system and increased lobbying for tougher sentences by the people who run the for-profit prison system. Um, you know, and, and there are any number of groups who work on these issues and that could really use your time, your money, your energy, your name on a mailing list to call a senator at just the right moment, and, and all of the above. And that's what I would urge you to do if you're worried about this stuff. So let's do one more question. Yeah. Uh, so I think you agree that the internet, in a way, is a shift in consciousness in the mm -hmm. sense that we're now interconnected in ways we've never been able to be connected before, not the crowdsourcing we're in the part. Yeah. So what effect do you think that's having on the generation of young kids who are now growing up with this as a starting point mm -hmm. still the activity and the total shift in consciousness on the more positive Right. right. So how does, how does this change consciousness for young people and for society as a whole? How does the internet do it? Well, as you say, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a major shift. You know, if you think about the, the project of our species, the thing that gave us the neocortex and, and turned us into the kind of primates that we are, it's, it's being social, right? It's, uh, it's you watch the kids all look out for leopards and that guy's going to go and get the, uh, get the fruit, right? And um, the problem of being social and working together in groups 
is that you have to pay a tax in the form of coordinative energy, you know, making sure everyone's doing their job, making sure two people don't think that they're watching for the leopard and no one's looking after the kids, you know, all of that stuff. And, you know, Ronald Coase, the, the um, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, he wrote this paper called The Theory of the Firm in 37 that basically nailed it, you know, that the job of organizations, whether it's the Vatican, WikiLeaks, uh, or um, uh, the mafia, or the U.S. government, is to figure out how to organize labor so that people work together as efficiently as possible. And what the internet has done is lowered the cost of working together in ways that are so radical that now we hardly even notice sometimes that we're working together. You know, when I was a, a, a young activist in the 1980s, 98% of my job was stuffing envelopes and putting stamps on them, and 2% was figuring out what to write and put in the envelopes. And now we get all that stuff for free. Um, and I think that it explains in part what happened with Occupy. Uh, so people criticized Occupy for its lack of, a, of an affirmative agenda. They, they, Occupy was an activity, not a manifesto. Um, and uh, I think that there's a good reason for that. I think that uh, historically, when you formed a group, you wanted to make sure that you were all in the same group for the same reason. Right? I, was, I was raised by Marxists, and there's no one a Marxist resents more than another Marxist with a point of view that differs in a way that nobody except someone who's read the collected works of Lenin would ever appreciate or understand. But there's a reason for that, and it's because if you form a group, if you get married and put all the energy into forming a group with, with people who actually <coughs> differ on something substantive, then you lose all that labor when you inevitably schism, right? Whereas, if the cost of forming the group is cheap enough, you don't have to even agree in advance why you're forming the group. You can form the group and you can see if you're all walking in the same direction until some of you peel off and you can wish them all the best. Right? And I think that that's, uh, politically, that's going to be the most significant thing that we get out of the internet, is this kind of very cheap group forming. Uh, there's a guy named David Reed, who's one of the architects of TCPIP, <coughs> who has a thing called Reed's Law, which is like a little known extension to Metcalfe's Law, that the value of a network goes up at the square of the number of users. He's, his is the value of a network goes up at the square of the rate that it makes um, group forming easy. Uh, so it's, it's, it, the, it, it's not just that when you have two fax machines, it's twice as useful as one, but also that if there's some way to address a bunch of fax machines in concert or for people who have like-minded points of view to find each other and fax each other, that that actually increases the rate much more quickly. Right? And so I, I, I do think that that's the most profound thing. I don't know how it will reflect itself exactly in kids' consciousness, but you can see probably the early echoes of it from things like not making plans of an evening, but just going out with a phone and all of your friends' numbers in your text message, in your, in your, uh, in your uh, address book, and using text messages to, in a fluid way, coordinate a series of loose-jointed loose activities through the course of an evening, as opposed to what we used to do, which is arrange long in advance what movie we're going to see and where we were going to see it and where we were going to meet. Now it's just like, you can be out tonight? Yeah, me too, right? And then send a text, where are you? Oh, I'm over here. Shall we meet somewhere in between? Anyway, uh, where would you like me to sit into Facebook? We have a, a table.